The dawning of the light began with Old Testament prophets who looking down through hundreds of years saw the coming of God's Messiah. In fact, one of them, Isaiah, wrote these words in Isaiah 9 beginning at verse 6 and 7. He says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You know the Old Testament contains dozens and dozens of similar prophecies all pointing to the coming of God's Messiah. How tragic then that there were so many in that first century world who missed the coming of the Messiah. We, we might say that they missed Christmas, if you, if you really think about it. Um, they missed out of the hope that came into the world. And unfortunately, that same thing is true for many today. There are a lot of people today who miss Christmas. Now, you're wondering, well, how could that be possible? How, how could a person miss Christmas? I mean, isn't Christmas right smack dab in front of us face to face? Uh, if you think about Christmas, uh, it's the most advertised and commercial holiday around the world of all the holidays that, that exist. I mean, nothing ever comes close to getting the amount of attention that Christmas does. Uh, it gets an entire month, or maybe it's two months, okay? I'm not sure, okay? Uh, it's the most anticipated holiday, the most celebrated holiday in the calendar for the entire year. I mean, I mean around the world. Um, and you'd think it'd be hard to miss Christmas. Because you and I are face to face, we're in this stretch time where we're face to face with Christmas. I mean, it's Christmas decorations and Christmas lighting and Christmas carols and Christmas songs in every store that you go to. And, uh, you know, Christmas gifts and Christmas shopping and Christmas uh, uh, festivals and, and uh, uh, Christmas carolers and all that. And we're still three weeks away from Christmas. And it's always right in front of us. How in the world could anybody miss Christmas? Christmas in the midst of everything that's going on around us. I mean, how many Hallmark Christmas movies can there be? You know, how many, think about it. Is it possible to miss Christmas? The answer is yes. You can miss it, and you can miss it probably for the same three reasons that uh, people 2,000 years ago missed Christmas. So we're going to look today at three reasons why you can miss Christmas. And then we want to talk about how you can avoid missing Christmas. What do you need to do to make sure that you don't miss Christmas? So let's look at three reasons. And the three reasons are really found in that story of the very first Christmas. And the first reason I want to mention is the, word, is the, the reason of busyness. Busyness. That's the first reason that you can miss Christmas. Uh, and as you read the Christmas story in Luke's gospel, 
There is a short statement that we read and, and maybe we just kind of gloss over it and we don't really pay attention to it. Listen as I read from Luke chapter 2 beginning at verse 1. It says, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. I want you to underline those last words in that passage. There was no room for them in the inn. <clears throat> Here is this very familiar story. I mean, Mary and Joseph are, are traveling to Bethlehem in compliance with the decree that had been issued by the Roman Emperor Augustus that they had to register for this census. The census was to be used for taxation purposes. And so here is Mary, and she's gone into labor. And Joseph is looking for lodging for her. Unfortunately, nobody had left the light on at the local Motel 6, okay? And so, you know, the innkeeper comes out and he says, sorry, no vacancies. I'm all fooled up. I have no room here. No vacancies. Mary gives birth and she places that newborn babe in a manger, which basically is a, a feeding trough for animals. Uh, and so instead of of Jesus being born in a cozy room there in the local inn, he's born in a stable, placed in a manger. And go back now and, and circle those words, no room. There was no room for them in the inn. See, from the innkeeper's standpoint, that was a good thing. I mean, that was a great thing for him. Business is booming. I mean, if you own a hotel, you want it to be sold out as much as possible, right? Because it means that, you know, this is good business. There was no vacancy. And so the innkeeper is thinking, man, this is great. He's sold out. You know, all these out-of-towners are coming in for the census. They're looking for a place to stay, and he's sold out. And his pockets are jingling with lots of change. Because he's making money. So that's good news for him. I mean, he has no use for this pregnant woman. He has no use for this newborn babe at all. And he certainly has no idea who, he, who it is that he's snubbing. The point is that he was busy with his own business. And that caused him to miss out the greatest opportunity of his lifetime. Here was the Son of God that was going to be born in his inn. Wouldn't that have been great for, for PR's sake? I mean, he could put up a sign, Son of God, born here. And he would be sold out for the rest of his life. People would want to come and, and, and stay there. Um, he literally missed the greatest opportunity. God was coming to earth in human form. And he could have been a part of that. Um, he could have been a part of that history. But he missed it because he was too busy with his business. Are you too busy with your business? Are you going to miss Christmas because of that? I'm not talking about um, your house or anything like that. I'm, I'm talking about your schedule. I'm talking about your thoughts. I'm talking about your time, your plans, your budget. Uh, are you so busy with everything that's going on in your life that you have no room? There's no room for Jesus in your life or in your mind or, or, or in your heart. You can be so busy at Christmas time that you miss out on meeting with God. And he's being born in the stable right next to you. And you're too busy to pay attention to that. That's the first reason that some people miss out on Christmas. It's just busyness. They get to going in so many different directions and they miss out on it. The second reason that people miss Christmas is because of familiarity. 
familiarity. What I mean by that is that you are so familiar with the Christmas story that it doesn't amaze you anymore. It doesn't dazzle you anymore. It doesn't, doesn't cause awe in your life anymore. I mean, you've heard it before. You know the story of Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus. You know about the wise men. You know about the shepherds. You know about the angels singing glory to God in the highest and all that. And so you're jaded. You're kind of bored by the Christmas story. You, you lack enthusiasm. Maybe your whole attitude toward Christmas is, oh, hum. Or maybe it's humbug. I don't know. But you're, you're so familiar with it that it doesn't excite you anymore. You become so familiar with something that you know, it doesn't amaze you anymore. You, you miss the beauty because you think that you understand it all. And so what do you do? You take it for granted. You know, you, you see it, but you don't do anything about it. Well, that's the mistake of familiarity. And that was a mistake that another group in that first century world, uh, fell prey to. And they were the religious leaders of Jerusalem. Uh, have you ever noticed that when, <clears throat> when Jesus decided, I mean, when God decided to come to earth in human form, that no religious leaders were invited to the birth? There wasn't a priest. There wasn't a Pharisee. There wasn't a scribe. There wasn't a philosopher. There wasn't a theologian. None of those were there. Uh, they all missed it because none of them were invited to the party. They missed it because they were so familiar with the story. Now, let me give you the picture as narrated in Matthew chapter 2. Now, the Bible tells us, of course, that wise men from the Far East came to Jerusalem. They had seen some kind of star and they had interpreted that star with uh, the prophecies that they had studied about the birth of a, of a new king in Israel. And so they figured that, um, let's go check it out, you know. Uh, they were most likely from the Middle East. Tradition tells us they were from, probably from ancient Persia. And so they studied the, scar, the stars, and when something unusual happened in the heavenly skies, uh, they said, let's go and check it out. It's probably why they're called wise men. They said, let's go check this thing out. And so after many days, these wise men arrive in Jerusalem, and they seek an audience with King Herod, the, the king of the Jews. After all, logic would say that this new king slash savior probably should be born in the palace of the current king. And so when they're ushered into Herod's presence, the first question they ask is, where is this savior of the world, this Messiah, this anointed one who is, is scheduled to be born? Where is this baby supposed to be born? Well, Herod, and, and we'll get to this guy later, okay? Herod hasn't the foggiest idea. The king of, of Judah he doesn't know diddly squat about that, okay? Uh, so he calls all the religious leaders and the scholars of Jerusalem, and he says, teach me about the prophecies concerning this coming Messiah. <clears throat> you know, hey, there's a king to be born in Judah. Where is he to be born? When is he to be born? And all these kinds of questions. Well, the religious leaders knew exactly what he was talking about because they had been waiting for hundreds of years for this event. They had been discussing it and debating it and dissecting it and, and detailing it for hundreds of years. So they knew what was going on. Look at, listed in your notes there, look at Matthew 2, beginning verse 4. <coughs> he says, uh, he called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law, and he asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people, Israel. Now, I want you to notice something interesting about this passage. Because a lot of people in Israel at that time were familiar with what was about to happen. I mean, they knew what was going to happen because they had been waiting for hundreds of years he had been promised, the Savior had been promised, and, he, you know, he was going to be born. And so they had been waiting. Years after years after years had been waiting. And, and they knew exactly 
where he was going to be born. I mean, they said, oh yeah, it's in the book of Micah. You know, chapter uh, 5, verse 4 says, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world will be born in Bethlehem. Everybody knows this. They know all the details. But even though they know the details, I mean, they were familiar with this. They were unimpressed. They were unconcerned about it. And they're talking about it, but they don't care enough to check it out for themselves. Uh, they've seen it all before. I mean, here's an astounding thing. These foreign dignitaries come and get an audience with King Herod, and they ask for information, and, and you know, here's the reference to Micah, and here's the reference to Bethlehem. And yet none of these religious leaders cared enough to go to Bethlehem and check it out for themselves. Do you know how far it is from Jerusalem to Bethlehem? Five miles. They wouldn't even go five miles to check it out themselves. Why? Because they were familiar with the story. They were so into all their debating and theology that they wouldn't even bother to check it out for themselves. They would rather debate about the Savior than go see the Savior. That's what I call jaded. Uh, that's what I call apathetic. They were unconcerned. The familiarity was there. And the lack of curiosity is absolutely stunning. They wouldn't go check it out. You know what? That can happen to you and me as well. Uh, you know, you've studied the Bible all your life. You've gone to church all your life. Maybe you've attended mass from the time you were in, in, in a, a small child. And... You've heard the story of Christmas over and over. And you can just become jaded to that story. You can miss it. You can miss it because you, you, you think, well, hey, I've seen it all. I mean, think about it. For centuries, the Jewish religious leaders have been waiting for the Messiah. <clears throat> but there was no room in their theology when God showed up. Um, all they wanted to do was debate. Friends, Jesus is not about religion. I could care less about religion. Jesus is not about religion. He's about relationship. And he says, you don't need the rules and the regulations and the rituals and, and all the restrictions. What you need is a relationship with God. You need the friendship with God. You know, God with us, Emmanuel. He came to establish a relationship with us and not to bring in some kind of new religion. And you see, what happened to the, the Jewish people over the centuries is, as they were waiting for that Messiah, is that they kept adding to their traditions in their worship of God. And they added tradition after tradition after tradition. More and more and more traditions. And so by the time that God shows up, by the time Jesus arrives, all they can do is pay attention to their traditions. And they ignore knowing God. Because their traditions were so important. Now, does that sound vaguely familiar? I mean, think about it. We have so many traditions about Christmas right now. <clears throat> and they just keep adding on. You know, we started with the Santa Claus thing. And then we add in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And then we've got Frosty the Snowman. And now you've got Elf on the Shelf, you know. And we've got all these traditions, and you keep piling them on, piling them on, piling them on. And nobody's even talking about the reason for the season. So all we can talk about is traditions. We don't talk about why it is that God came to earth. But you know what? It makes a huge difference. It'll make a huge difference for, your, in, for the rest of your life. And if you don't know the reason for the season... And folks, you're no better off than those religious leaders were 2,000 years ago who wouldn't walk five miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to check it out for themselves. You know, today there's a lot of intelligent people who participate in all of the Christian traditions that are out there. You know, they put up lights and they have parties and they send out cards and they buy presents. And um, they do every single one of those traditions yet they show no concern at all for checking out why we do this stuff in the very first place. Why we even have Christmas. They don't, they don't want to check it out. See, <clears throat> the reason for Christmas 
is so that God could have a relationship with you and with me. Uh, and if you miss it, then you're going to miss Christmas altogether. Uh, you, can, you can miss Christmas even though you put up a tree. You can put up lights and you can still be in the dark. The Bible tells us that, people, uh, that people's minds are in the dark with the result that they have missed out on the life that comes from God. They just don't get it. Why? Because of busyness, because of familiarity. There's a third reason why most people miss Christmas. And that's the reason of fear. The reason of fear. Fear will cause you to miss the true meaning of Christmas this year. Isn't it a sad fact that some people actually fear Christmas? Um, they're afraid of it. That's why they fight against it, you know. We're not going to say Merry Christmas in our store, you know. They're afraid of it. Um, have you noticed Starbucks holiday cups? Talk about a cop-out. Check it out. Happy coffee. Or no, excuse me, Merry coffee. Woo! They fight Christmas. They fight the nativity scene. They don't want the nativity scene up. They bring lawsuits against it. Um, because they're afraid of the message of Christmas. Now, this wasn't the innkeeper's problem. This wasn't the religious leader's problems. This was Herod's problem. Herod, basically, folks, was a lunatic. I mean, first of all, he was not a Jew. He was an Idumean who had been appointed to the office of king of the Jews uh, by political intrigue. He had weaseled his way into the Roman government and uh, was appointed to be king of the Jews. And uh, the citizens of, of, of the Holy Land hated Herod. Um, Herod was also very, very paranoid. <clears throat> he was afraid of anybody who might threaten his, his throne, his kingdom, his, his reign over the kingdom. He was afraid of anybody who might be a threat to depose him from his position as king. He was so paranoid that anybody who got close to maybe being in a position to overthrow him, he would have them put to death. He had his wife put to death because he thought that she was conspiring against him and was going to overthrow him. He had his mother put to death because she thought he was going to depose him from the throne. He had his brother-in-law put to death because he was a threat to him. He had two of his sons killed in, in their early ages because he thought that they would rise up and, and would replace him. <clears throat> and five days before he died, he had all of his sons who were in the area put to death so that they could not succeed him on the throne. Not only that, but he had rounded up and arrested many prominent Jewish leaders and put them into prison <clears throat> with the order that on the day that he died, they were to be put to death. Because he said, when I die, there's not going to be any weeping for me. But if these people are killed on the same day, there will be plenty of weeping in Jerusalem on the day that I die. The guy was a basket case. He was nuts. And so in Matthew 2 verse 3 it says, King Herod was deeply disturbed. Boy, that's an understatement. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. Everybody was in Jerusalem was upset because Herod was upset. When Herod gets upset, heads roll. Okay? So they were, they were upset about that. So here are the wise men, and they show up and say, where's this baby who's born to be the king of the Jews? <clears throat> Herod goes ballistic. I mean, he goes nuclear. And, and he's, he's just going crazy saying, we've got to find this guy because I'm not going to have anybody take my place as king of the Jews. And um, he was afraid of Christmas because he was afraid of anybody who might threaten his kingdom. And if you know the, the subsequent uh, story as, as told in the rest of the second chapter of Matthew, uh, in an attempt to wipe out all the competition, Herod orders that every child in, in Bethlehem, two years of age and under, be put to death by the sword. Because he will have nobody compete with him about his throne. And so he missed out on Christmas because of fear. 
But you know what? Herod's not alone. A lot of people miss out on Christmas because they're afraid to get to know God. They're afraid to get to know God for maybe th three different reasons. First of all, that if they come to know God, they're going to lose their freedom. And they're not going to be able to do whatever they want to do. And they're going to lose their fun. They're not going to have fun anymore. Because now they're a Christian. And they're going to become a fanatic. They're going to carry around a big family Bible. And they're going to yell out, turn or burn, you know. And, and so they're afraid of God for a variety of reasons. Folks, when you invite Jesus Christ into your life, he doesn't make you more religious. He makes you more human. Uh, you know, the bottom line is that you are made by God and you are made for God. And until you understand that, life is not going to make any sense. I mean, you can try to find meaning in life by uh, making money and having fun and, and you know, being maybe a world-class hunter. And you can have all the pleasure and passions and possessions and, and position in life, all the sex and status and salary that you want. You can try everything, to, that different, all sorts of different things to fill that hole, that void inside of your life. But none of it's going to work. <clears throat> because that hole was created by God. And only God can fill that hole. You were made by God and for God. And life is not going to make sense until you understand that. See, the only reason that you're alive is to love God. That's his purpose for you. He wants you to learn to love him back. And, and God wants you to know him. He wants you to have a, a friendship, a relationship with him. Um, that's why he came to earth in human form. So that you could have a relationship with him. And so God says, I want you to get rid of that fear in your life. I mean, the bottom line on, on Herod's deepest fear was simply this. I don't want anybody to be in control except me. That's, who, that's what Herod thought. Um, does that sound familiar? I don't want anybody to be in control but me. Uh, I don't want anybody else to be king. I want to be the king of my life. Uh, and that's why a lot of people fear God. Because the bottom line is they want to be their own God. They want to call the shots in their life. They want to make all the decisions. They want to go their way. They want to be king. That was Herod's mentality. I'm not going to let anybody else be the king in my life. It's just going to be me. Look at 1 Timothy 6.21. Some of these people have missed the most important thing in life. They don't know God. See, you can know all sorts of other stuff. But if you don't know God, you've missed the purpose of your life. <clears throat> because, folks, you weren't put on this planet to just check off things on your to-do list. To keep a bucket list and you just work through it and all that. You weren't put on this earth for that. You were put on this earth to know God and to prepare for being with him in eternity forever. So how then do we not miss Christmas? What is it that we can do to make sure that we don't miss Christmas? Um, let me give you a real simple formula. Remember when you were in school, they taught you these little formulas for safety. Uh, for instance, um, if your shirt were to call catch on fire, what should you do? Stop. Stop, drop, and roll. Yeah, that's a formula, okay? When you were crossing a street, what did they teach you to do? Stop, look, listen to see if there's any traffic coming. Well, let's use that same formula to make sure that you don't miss Christmas, okay? And number one, stop. Stop filling your life with less important things. Stop filling your life with less important things. That's the first thing you've got to do. Stop filling your life with things that really don't matter. I mean, don't let busyness keep you from knowing God. <clears throat> the psalmist said this in Psalm 39, verse 6. We are merely moving shadows and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. We heap up wealth not knowing who will spend it. Does that sound like your life? I mean, you're rushing here and you're rushing there and you're rushing everywhere to spend and to acquire and to experience and to see and to do and you're just 
you're just this ball of energy going and, and, and all of these things. And, and so you just go out and you've got to run the rat race. Uh, folks, you don't want to run the rat race. Because even if you run the rat race, guess what? You're still a rat. Okay? Bottom line, humans were not built to run rat races. And, and folks, you can become so busy making a living that you forget to make a life. Beware of the barrenness of the busy life. Um, because activity and productivity are not the same thing. Okay? So what's the antidote? The antidote is stop running and, and slow down. That's the first way you really get to know the meaning of Christmas. You've got to stop running and slow down. The psalmist said in 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. Um, the famous mathematician and philosopher Bly Pascal said this, All of men's problems come from his inability to sit still. That's probably a pretty good thought. You know, we are so hurried and so worried and we can't stop filling our lives with things that really don't matter. And what do we do? We crowd out God and all of a sudden we're just like the innkeeper. There is no room. There's no room for God. I find it really interesting in the Christmas story that the very first people that the announcement is made that the Messiah has been born is to shepherds. Why shepherds? Why these sheep herders? I mean, they were the lowest rung on the status ladder in that day and time. What was so special about shepherds? Because they weren't busy. They were sitting around a campfire watching sheep. And uh, you know what? If an angel showed up, they had time to listen. There was no television. There was no parties, Christmas parties to go to. There was no last minute dash out to buy a gift for Aunt Sally. And so when the angel showed up, they had time to listen to him. Folks, God speaks to people who are still enough and willing enough to listen. And God doesn't talk to you if you say, excuse me, God, I, I don't have time for you, but maybe tomorrow you can, you can talk to me. <clears throat> no wonder God never talks to you. If you're so busy that you can't listen to God, then he's not going to talk to you. Um, you don't have time to just sit still and be quiet. And maybe get into God's word and let him speak to you. <coughs> you know, somebody who says, I just don't have time to know God. You know what? You're too busy if that's where you are in life. So you've got to stop filling your life with less important things. And then second, look. Look closely at why Jesus came. And what do I mean by that? You need to look at why did Jesus come? I mean, you know that he came. I mean, it's Christmas. We, we kind of know what Christmas is about. But do we know why he came? Could, could you give me five or six reasons why Jesus came at Christmas time to this earth? You need to look closely at why Jesus came. I mean, make an effort to check it out. Um, so investigate Jesus. Who, who was he? What did he claim to be? What did he say? What did he do? Uh, what impact did he have on the world at that day and time? What impact does he have in our world today? What difference does it make in my life? Do an investigation. Uh, by the way, that's what Herod told the wise men. In fact, that's the one thing that Herod did right. He told him in, in Matthew 2 and verse 8, go and make a careful search for the child. Um, that's a pretty good advice. Go check it out for yourself. Go make a careful search for the child. See, the bottom line is, there's absolutely no way you're getting to heaven on your own. Not a zip. Nil. It's not going to happen. You're not going to get to heaven through your own works. You're not good enough. I'm not good enough, okay? And, you know, if we could get to heaven by being a nice person, then Jesus coming to this earth was unnecessary. His death on the cross would have been a colossal tragedy and waste. The angel said to the shepherds, For unto you is born this day a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Folks, 
you and I need a Savior. And, and really the only rational response to that is to say, yeah, yeah you're right, preacher. I'm flawed. I, I need a Savior. I'm not perfect. I'm not God. And I need a Savior. So I come to God and I just say, God, here I am. Jeremiah in 29 verse 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I want to challenge you to uh, don't be like those people who celebrate all the traditions of Christmas. You know, year after year after year with zero curiosity as to why we celebrate Christmas. You know, um, check it out. Look into it. What does it mean for my life today? Why do we actually celebrate Christmas? Um, God says, you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. God says, I want you to be a seeker. I want you to check me out. And so look closely at why Jesus came. And then the third thing, listen. Listen to the good news of Christmas. Folks, don't be afraid of the good news. I mean, why would anybody be afraid of good news? The, the narrative in Luke 2, verse 10 and 11 says, The angel assured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. So what is this good news? Uh, Jesus put it this way in John 10, 10. He says, I am come that, they, that you might have life and you might have it to the full. Circle those words there in, in John 10, 10 in your notes. The words life and full. See, that's why Jesus came at Christmas. That's what he came to do, to give you life to the full. Um, you know why he came to give you life to the full? Because you're not living life to the full, okay? <laughs> that's the bottom line. I guarantee that. You're not living life to the full. You cannot live life to the full until you're connected to the Creator through a relationship with Jesus Christ, to give you a purpose and a meaning to life. Only God can give you that purpose to life. And when that happens, then you can begin to live life to the full. There are a lot of people today who really aren't living. They're just existing. They get up in the morning, they go to work, they come home, they eat dinner, they watch TV, they go to bed, they go out and party all weekend, and they think, this is really living. That's not living. That's just existing. You lose your fear when you come to understand why Jesus came. John 3, 17 says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come to give us fear. Okay? Look, he says, but he came to save the world through him. He didn't come to give you fear. He came to bring you salvation. To bring you hope. That's what the candle is all about. To bring you hope. <clears throat> I don't know what kind of year you've had. Could have been a tough year. Could have been a rough year. Could have been a challenging year. Um, this year and the last few years have been really rough in the Crouch household, okay? With my wife's health. But I want you to know that even in the midst of all that we're going through, there is a peace. There is a joy. See, that's what the angel said Jesus would do. He would bring joy into our situation. He says, I've come that you might have life. The angel said he came that you might have joy. He says, I didn't come to condemn you. I came to save you. And you're not really living until you come to him. So there's busyness. There's familiarity. There's fear. Which, which one of those three is keeping you from really experiencing Christmas? What is it going to prevent you or, or cause you to miss Christmas? So you need to come to God humbly and do these three things. You need to stop. You know, the Bible says Christ carried the burden of our sins on the cross so that we would stop living for sin and start living for what is right. His wounds heal us. So I stop living the old way and I start living a new life. Then we need to look. The Bible says, let all the world look to me for salvation. 
For I am God and there is no other. And then we need to listen. The Bible says, listen to what God says. This is the hour to receive God's favor. Today is the day to be saved. Did you catch that? It's not tomorrow. It's not next week. It's not next year. It's not in 10 years. Now, why would it say that? Folks, because you're not guaranteed 10 years. You're not guaranteed this next year. You're not guaranteed this week. You're not even guaranteed this afternoon. Whatever you're going to do, you need to do it now because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. Neither am I. So today, he says, is the day of salvation. Today is the day to trust him with your life. I'm going to lead us <clears throat> in a word of prayer in just a moment. And I invite you to pray this prayer with me. You don't have to say it aloud. You're saying it in your heart. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what the words you say are as much as it matters the attitude of your heart. Uh, and really, there's only one attitude that you need to be saved. And that is an attitude of humility to, to really say, God, I believe that you're God and, and I'm not. And I need a Savior. I can't save myself. I can't get into heaven through my own efforts. Uh, I can't forgive my own sin. So I need you as my Lord and Savior. I, I encourage you to do that this morning. Today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Today is the important time. Don't miss Christmas. Don't be so busy. Don't be so caught up in the familiarity. Oh, I know the story. I know the plan of salvation. I've heard it all before again and again. Um, don't say no. Don't let fear of what turning your life over to God might look like in your life. I guarantee you it's going to be 180 degrees in what you think it's going to be. It's going to be something wonderful. So let's pray. Would you just pray this prayer in your heart? Just say something like this. Dear God, I don't understand it all. But I want to be gut level honest with you. I want to be totally honest with you right now, Father. I've allowed busyness to keep me from knowing you. And I've allowed even being familiar with things to, to keep me from knowing you. And I've allowed fear to keep me also from knowing you. I thank you, though, that you love me in spite of all my faults and all my failures. So this Christmas season, as much as I know how, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart. I open my life up to you. No, I don't understand it all. I've got doubts. I've got questions. But I want a relationship with you. I need a Savior. I realize that if I didn't need one, you wouldn't have come at Christmas time. You said a Savior has been born so that I can accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I want to learn to love Him and I want to learn to trust Him for the rest of my life. And I humbly make this request in your name. Amen. <clears throat> we're going to stand together and we're going to sing a great little song. I have decided to follow Jesus. Maybe today, December 1, 2019, might be the day when you say, I'm not going to miss Christmas this year. I'm going to make Jesus the Savior, the Lord of my life. I'm going to be waiting here at the front. Come and let me talk with you. Come and let me pray with you. Say yes to Jesus Christ today. Don't miss Christmas.